By the way, calibration is kind of like one of those things. Uh, some people still think, that, uh, some people still are out there saying, don't do any of that dojo calibration crap. Uh, however, no, once, that's, how, once how we, could that uh, even be? Like exactly. having tried it, it makes such a big difference. Well, uh, there's, um, it's like everything, right? So it's like everything in the sense that there's a way to do it the wrong way. Uh, uh, and mm -hmm. there's a way to do it the right way. And there are some details there that could lead a learner astray. I'm sure we could touch mm -hmm. on a couple of them today. I don't want to say, I don't want to say there's no one out there that teaches the, the basics of calibration, but like, but it's not, it's so hard to find the information, yeah. you know, and, and a lot of it, yeah. I think a lot of it just sort of organically happens for pipers as they get better and better, but it's kind of like, you know, uh, at, at some point someone should just teach you like the multiplication table, you know, mm -hmm. right. And it's the same with calibration, but like, um, and calibration is one of many, 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 many examples where it's like, why don't, why don't we just teach it to people like, you know, like the way that it actually is. Why don't we just like get that information out there? And I started doing that back in the day and you know, the rest is history. That's basically what the dojo is. Um, we had somebody on our internal discord in the membership saying like, I assume that, and I'll, I'm going to leave the name out, but I, I'm going to assume that any information we get from, you know, uh, insert really well established bagpiping institution here. I would assume that you're cool with us supplementing what you do at the dojo with anything we hear from these famous institutions. That is a false assumption. And it's not because and the it's not because these Shots big, fired. No, but it's not because these big piping institutions are bad. Okay? But it is. Well, here's one thing that's true. 100 percent true. Okay, and it shouldn't be that controversial. Uh, I saw things that the mainstream bagpiping world was doing as being like not either not quite right or you know, like way too vague and unclear. Like I saw those things and I thought to myself, I think there's a better way of doing that. Or, uh, or at least a, a, at the very least, even if you don't agree, it's better. Uh, here's a different way of approaching that where people might have more success with that. Right. And so a lot mm -hmm. of times, like a lot of times what you would normally be taught, right. Uh, you know, at the dojo, we will say, no, no, <laughs> we will say, no, that's not it. Here's what we think it is. Uh, and we'll say that on a regular basis. By the way, calibration is kind of like one of those things. Uh, some people still think, that, or some people still are out there saying, don't do any of that dojo calibration crap. Uh, however, no, once, that's, how, once how we, could that uh, even be? Like exactly. having tried it, it makes such a big difference. Well, uh, there's, um, it's like everything, right? So it's like everything in the sense that there's a way to do it the wrong way. Uh, and mm -hmm. there's a way to do it the right way. And there are some details there that could lead a learner astray. I'm sure we could touch mm -hmm. on a couple of them today. Uh, but uh, so is that, that's what we're doing, right? We're talking about calibration. Yeah. Let's talk calibration, yeah. man. Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, my point is, where do you think Mike Swan got that from? You got that from the yeah, dojo. Um, I think if I remember right, that was right about the time that he started doing dojo. So yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Um, In and, fact, uh, I, I kind of feel like maybe there was a pipe majors clinic and maybe it came up during that. Mm -hmm. Does that sound right? I can't remember exactly if that sure, was. Sure. Calibration would, calibration is just a result of basic logic. Okay. Being applied to the bagpipe. Okay. So let's go through the logic. Um, in a previous episode, if we did this chronologically, we talked about making your bag airtight, right? And, mm -hmm. and uh, we talked about how we don't want one iota throwback. We don't want one iota mm -hmm. of air sneaking out of the bag because any molecule of air that's not passing through the reeds uh, is, is a waste, right? And it makes the instrument harder to play and therefore, right, the instrument's harder to play and therefore we're not going to be able to focus on improving the quality of the music. We're not going to be uh, able to focus on the fine tuning details. We're not going to be able to focus on playing unison or ensemble. Uh, mm -hmm. and you know, we're not going to be able to focus on not making mistakes, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So, it's uh, you know, just a survival game. Exactly. And we, I'm sure everyone listening has been in that situation where you're so starved for air. You're struggling so much just to keep the pipes going that everything else is an afterthought. And of course, bad things begin to happen. Mistake. Mistake, mistake. Now you're way off the tune. 
you know, basically uh, now you had a three second choke and then, you know, you're in, in, maybe you're now you're back on track. You're not making mistakes, but you're totally not in unison with the rest of the group. You have no idea how the performance yeah. went. You're just, you're just glad that the performance is over. Just think about that, right? You travel a long distance and you're, but your bagpipe is so hard that really the only thing positive that happened you know, as you, you know, you made this 500 mile trip somewhere. The only positive thing that happened is that you got to the end without dying. Right. It, right. It's that, over. <laughs> yeah, that, exactly. Like the best thing that happened all day is the end of the performance. That's a bad thing. Yeah. Really bad. People it don't doesn't pause make to you think feel about encouraged to do yeah. it again either. Absolutely. Right. So, so bagpipe efficiency is the name of the game. What's the definition of efficiency? Uh, that's rhetorical. I'm just going to, I'm about to just tell you, right? Uh, efficiency means this and not just in the bagpipe world, like in, in the, in the world world, efficiency means, uh, minimum input, maximum output. That's what efficiency means, right? So like if your car is fuel efficient, it means minimum input, right? Minimum fuel to go maximum distance. That's what fuel efficiency is. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then bagpipes is the same thing minimum air input to get maximum length of time, good quality bagpipe output, right? That's what, that's what bagpipe efficiency is all about. So we want to make sure the bag is airtight, right? Any air that's leaking through the skin of the bag, so to speak, okay, is wasted. That's decreasing our fuel efficiency, right? Like we're, mm -hmm. we're driving a pickup truck instead of a Toyota Prius, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. like it's leaking out. And then the next one would be making sure all the hemp and all the joints and the instrument are sounding really good. And don't forget about the reed seats where the reed, uh, where the reed actually sits in the, mm -hmm. uh, in the joint, right? It should be so, uh, it should be so solid in the joint that you're not like uncomfortable just swinging it around. Okay. That's for, how for people listening right now, Andrew is dangling his drone by the reed. He's got his reed in so yeah. tight. This is like when you go buy one of those uh, ice creams and they flip it upside down to show you how thick oh, it is. Oh, yeah. That is like that, isn't it? What is that? Okay. Dairy Queen? Is that what it is? That's oh, what, yeah. That's right. where they do that. So weird. I always feel so bad for like, you know, like the young kids who are just trying to like look cool, uh, and, but they have to work at Dairy Queen, which by the way, is I, I'm all good with it. Like, <laughs> you know, go, get out there, get a job. It's better than... My little, my little sister worked at Dairy Queen in college. I'm going to text her after this. Oh, yeah. Um, tell hey, her remember I when you were a job. loser? Uh, no, no, you're not never a loser. If you go out and get a job, <laughs> got to do it somehow. See, I never really had to do it. Yeah. Like, so I was so spoiled as a kid, tangent alert. I was so spoiled as a kid because like, you know, uh, every couple of weeks, uh, someone would call my dad and say, Hey, we need a piper for a gig. And my dad, you know, mm -hmm. my dad would always say like, you know, hey, you want this gig? And I would say, yes. And when I was really young, he would come with me and just tune me up and I would do this gig. But then mm. like, you know, the bride, the, then the bride drops you 150 bucks. For an 11 year old, right, 150 yeah. bucks is an insane amount of money, right? And then, you know, <laughs> yeah. by the time you're, by the time I was 14 and 15, I would get gigs, you know, every couple of weeks I'd get 250 bucks or something or 300 bucks. Right. And like, so- That'll last you till the next gig for sure. And there's no way I'm working at Dairy Queen you know, uh, I'm just waiting, sitting around waiting for those gigs. And then, um, and then older still, I remember, uh, just anecdote, just a little anecdote. I remember, um, I'd be hanging around British Columbia cause I went to college at SFU, uh, Simon Fraser university. Mm -hmm. Uh, but like during the summer, Jack Lee would get extremely. Oh, don't worry, Andrew. We know what SFU is. Don't okay. worry. I think well, the, not I think everybody. The whole you know, <laughs> I'm not. Maybe not everyone doesn't know. But in Vancouver, Simon Fraser University. But I was a college student, and Jack Lee would get super busy during the summers. You know, like summertime with the SFU pipe band and all of his solos. And then Jack would also go away and teach at a lot of different piping schools during the summer. So like he would say, sure. he would say, Andrew, can you teach? You know. Will and Tim and Billy and Bobby and so and so and like quite literally for the summer, Jack would just, you know, like I would temporarily, you know, teach his students private lessons to keep them going during the summer and to keep the solos going. Yeah. So like, I I guess my point is I never actually had to work hard ever in my life. I mean, <laughs> it was it was hard work. You sit there and you have to teach, and that's hard work. But like for me, it's just something yeah. I've always loved doing. So, so like, yeah, I've really cheated life in that respect. 
Uh, yeah, so, so all of us are sitting back right now going, must be nice. Yeah, must well, be nice to be Andrew Douglas. It is hard work. And it's, it's been a real challenge. Uh, we're still on our tangent. It's been a real challenge for me in recent years because the dojo has grown so big. Like we're like yeah. this huge thing and we have this huge team of amazing players and teachers and administrators. And like now my, my job is a, a lot of management and uh, uh, mm. I'm, I'm sure. Takes you away from actually getting your hands on the chanter, right? Well, and, and I'm sure, you know, uh, I'm sure a lot of people uh, around the world would confirm like management probably isn't my, my number one skill set. So I've been having to like yeah. try and relearn that as well. But I digress. Okay, so we talked about how air efficiency is really important and getting the bagpipe to be airtight is step one. Okay. Now step Mm -hmm. two is really important. All right. And it's just a continuation of the same logic. We want our drone reads to have the best possible fuel efficiency as well. Right. So this is where you see, I'm holding up a drone read here. This Mm -hmm. is where we want, this is where we want the air to go through. We want it to go through these little holes in the reeds. And by the way, uh, you can picture, here's a, uh, here's a chanter reed too, right? The chanter reed's got this little opening, and hopefully it makes sense to everybody that that is where we want the air to go through. In between right? the blades of the chanter yeah, reed. I think so. And up under the tongue of the drone reed yeah. through that hole. Those are the holes we want makes air to, to escape. Me. If air doesn't escape yeah. through there, if air doesn't go through there and result in the vibration of the reeds, uh, it, it, then uh, it's, it's being wasted. Hopefully that makes sense, mm-hmm. right? So we want the air May, to go through the I'm hole. I'm with you so far. Yeah. Now, however, with that said, we all know different reeds can take different amounts of air. Like different volumes of air are going to pass through different reeds. That's the, when you call mm-hmm. up your reed maker and you say, I want a hard reed. What is hard referring to? Hard's referring to how much air is going to need to go through there and at what rate uh, in order mm-hmm. to produce the vibration of the reed. So hard means a lot of air is going to be required. Easy means significantly less air. And by the way, I'm using that as an approximate term. I think there's science down there somewhere. Like I think there's, yeah. um, I think there's like volume and rate of flow and you know atmospheric pressure and all sorts of like fun inter- and like back pressure. I think there's like back pressure yeah. and I think there's um, you know I think there's like a miniature low pressure system and I think there's a adiabatic cooling and all sorts of fun stuff that happens like uh, that happens at the reed vibration like molecule level but like let's just keep it simple amount of air right just think of it as like how much air do you how much air am i going to need right mm-hmm. uh it, it, it's the same way you think about your car by the way like internal combustion you know uh that's a complicated topic but you can think of it as simple terms like how much gas do i got to put in to how go how gas far do I need? yeah Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's the same sort of thing. We're, we're simplifying it, but, but the basics are there and the logic is there. So uh, we want our drone reads to take the absolute minimum amount of air required, okay, uh, while still making a good sound, okay? We want the reads mm-hmm. to take the absolute minimum amount of air required to, uh, to make a good sound. So uh, what is that? Uh, here, pop quiz for Jim. What, what does that rely on? So the, the reeds, we want to take the minimum amount of air. What is the, um, what is the unit of measurement that we use for that? What is the... Uh, uh, pounds this, per inch. Pounds per inch. Wrong. Mm. Yeah. What's the... The unit of measurement... I always, I always mess it up. The unit of measurement's really simple, okay? Up. It's not scientific, okay? It's not scientific, it's logical. So where our drone reads are concerned, the thing we're going to measure against is the strength of the chanter read, okay? It's very easy to adjust the strength of your drone read. It's very difficult and also permanent to adjust the strength of your chanter read, okay? So if we want to adjust, if we want to make the chanter read harder, I'm not even quite sure how you would do that. Like, I guess you could use a poker and open up the staple. That might, right, who knows what's going to happen. Little. And then we, we're all familiar with all the sneaky things that we do that we shouldn't to try and make the read easier. What you should all, do is just the pick the pinches. right. Yeah. What you should do is just pick the right chanter read to begin with. Okay. But uh, it's very hard to change that, uh, certainly without really negative consequences. But it's very simple to change this. 
Okay? So, mm-hmm. so everything we do here is going to be based on the chanter. That's thing number one. So my chanter read That's takes... Everything we, er, everything we do with the drone read is going to be based on the chanter for our listening audience. Who, correct. So that's why we say... That's why we're going to say we're going to calibrate our drone reads to our chanter read. The reason for mm-hmm. that is because the chanter read is very difficult uh, and, and not particularly logical to make significant uh, airflow changes to. Uh, by the way, just a quick sound check. If I do this... Does that sound okay? Does that sound okay yeah, that's when not I... A, it, it's not unpleasantly loud or anything. That's a good... Ba- it sounds it, good. It's not super distorted. Yeah, I have, my, I have other microphones actually for that purpose. So just making sure mm. that they work. And if I mute my speaking microphone, it's usually not too distorted. Okay, so um, what we want to do is we want to gauge the strength of our chanter read, and then we want to calibrate our drone reads to that, okay? If our drone reads take more air than necessary, hopefully it makes sense to everyone listening that you're no longer operating at maximum efficiency. If our reads Mm -hmm. are taking more air than necessary, our bagpipe is less efficient, okay? So we're not going to get as much... Our bagpipe's a gas guzzler. Right. Well, our miles per gallon just went, just went uh, considerably down. Remember, we're talking about controlling the rate at which our bagpipes leak air at this point because you have to expend air. It has to go through the reeds. Uh, but we want to make sure we minimize that. So, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to adjust our reeds for that. And I'm going to show you two and a half different ways to do that. Mm-hmm. Or I'm going to explain two and a half different ways. The first way is the quick and dirty way. The quick and dirty way is my recommendation for you to start with, okay? Everybody out there in the world. The quick and dirty way uh, is like this. First of all, I'm going to mouth blow my chanter read, and I'm going to get a sense for how hard that read is and how hard I can blow on that read before funky stuff starts to happen. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Funky stuff like squeaks Mm -hmm. and uh, squawks or chirps or something like that. So just listen. I'm just going to play this read. And um, it's going to sound wonky, but I'm doing it to get a real feel for the read and, um, and how hard, quote unquote, hard it is. Right? And I'm purposefully overblowing that read. And you, hopefully you heard some of those nasty gurgles and stuff. Uh, Down for on a emoji, brief, right? Yeah. For, and for a brief yeah. moment in time, for a brief moment in time, that is done on purpose. Cool. So now in my mind, okay, I have an idea of how hard that read is. Okay. Now, um, preferably this is done. uh, I just, I have my teaching bagpipe here. Uh, With your drone put together, I'm just kind of whipping together a quick lesson here. With my drone Mm -hmm. put together Mm -hmm. like so, okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to mouth blow my drone read. All right. uh, And Make sure that the drone read, this is the key, a key point here, making sure that the drone read shuts off, okay, at a, certain, right. at a certain pressure. Like what happens when you blow too hard on a drone read? We all know too hard on a drone read, the, moist, or the air pressure rather sort of like overwhelms it and it clamps shut and then it turns off, right? It's like it but I'm going to use that, that tongue against the hole. I'm going to use that as a tool, right? So if my drone read shuts off, I know that um, it's getting more air than it can handle, okay? So, uh, for exa- uh, uh, so I'm just going to mouth blow this read. I'm going to put my lips right here above the top bridle, okay? And I'm going to go for it. And by the way, tenor drones are a lot easier to mouth blow than bass drone reads because of the length of the read. Yeah. But no matter how hard I blow on this read right now, Notice how I can't get it to shut off. By the way, it also yeah. just sounds it also just sounds open and not pleasant. I don't could you hear that all right or uh when I was doing Oh, it? I could I could hear the noise. I don't know if we're going to get all of the nuance of the sound necessarily, but we could right. hear that it was making noise, yeah. So I'm just going to double check, make sure I'm not crazy. <laughs> yeah. Uh when I I guess it did sort of shut off when I blew as hard as I possibly can. Okay. So it, it refuses to shut off. So that's an indication, right? Because remember, I only had to blow a little bit hard on the chanter read to get it to sound crappy. Meanwhile, I can blow as hard as I can, and this thing's still going. So what mm-hmm. does that mean logically? Logic, too open. Yeah, logically speaking, this read is too open. In other words, it's taking too much air. 
Okay? Yeah. So I'm going to close down this read. How, how do you close down the read? Okay? Just sort of generally right. speaking. The read has a certain amount of openness. So if you're watching the video, you can see I'm, I'm holding my hands in like a V shape here. Right? This is quite open. If I can get that V shape to decrease, right, that'll decrease the amount of air that gets in. It's kind of like the aperture of a camera, right? Opening and shutting, right? So what I want to do is I want to close down the aperture of the reed so less air gets through. Now, if I close it down too much, which I will now attempt to do for purposes of demonstration, so I'm going to take the bridle, uh, the first bridle on the reed, and I'm going to slide it downwards to close the V shape. So you can maybe see in the camera, you can see that that read, it's kind of, yeah. my, my camera wants to focus on my face naturally because right. I'm such a beauty. But uh, yeah, but you can see it's like open. So what we want to do is close it down a little bit and we're going to slide that bridle. And on a synthetic read, it's just a tiny split hair is all you have to slide that thing. Okay. But I'm going to slide and this it is down. On different kinds of reeds, this will look like an O-ring or a, a really thick rubber band. Or yes, exactly. Something but along those lines. All simple reeds have the ba same basic construction. Okay, so I'm going to slide this down. Uh, and Actually, gonna... maybe we should clarify too, Andrew, that like with the surge in popularity of inverted base reeds, down might be up, right? Just right. Well, think about it as closing... Whichever direction closes the tongue more. Right, yeah. exactly. Think about that V-shaped aperture and opening and closing it all right so if you have an inverted tongue right it's still the same this is still the same basic thing anyway i closed it down now i'll mouth blow it again uh stick it in my drone first but can you see how now when i mouth blow the reed it almost instantly shuts off so the yeah, aperture is so closed now right so the aperture is so closed now that it totally shuts off on me that's not what we want Okay, we know, we know how our, our pipe chanter feels. So uh, if we blow a nice solid tone on the chanter reed, at this point, logic dictates this reed is just going to shut off on us. So mm -hmm. obviously if the reed shuts off, that's not what we want. However, if the reed stays going, but just barely, okay, if the reed stays going, but just barely, that's kind of what we want. So anyway, I need to split the difference of what I just did. Okay. <laughs> There we go. And I blow a little too hard and it shuts off. And I might just nurture it well, back the other way. Yep, go ahead. While you do that, Andrew, I'm curious. It, what, I've, I've always heard, and, I've, and I wonder if you've heard this as well or if you've got anything to it, that when you move that band up and down, it needs to be perfectly straight all the way around the body of the reed, that like any yeah. kind of angle can do funky things to it. So um, I definitely err on the side of believing that. Um, but, uh, also at the same time, it's probably not worth overthinking it. <laughs> you mm -hmm, know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, something like that. Sure. Like we definitely, if the reed, we probably don't want the tongue of the reed to be doing this all the time. Yeah. Uh, like this sort of like, like a weird vibration shape. We probably just want it to be vibrating up and down. I'm not sure about that. I just, I'm just kind of like making an assumption. We kind of want it to just flap. So yeah. So a nice straight bridle is probably what we want. Anyway, to mm -hmm. summarize, uh, I just set that. I just set the strength of that reed with my mouth, so that it was comparable to the strength of the chanter reed. Okay. Now, when I put my pipes together, I'm going to be in the ballpark because mm -hmm. of that basic calibration process. Okay. So that's um, that's method number one. Okay. That's what I recommend everybody get started with. It's just a little bit of mouth blowing. You 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 would mouth blow all three of the drone reeds and set them to be pretty good relative to the chanter reed. Uh, by the way, mm -hmm. if, if you know your bagpipe's airtight, uh, and now you're setting about calibra uh, calibrating your reeds uh, because your pipe doesn't feel comfortable, as soon as you do that, you'll instantly feel a huge difference in your pipes. Okay, instantly. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's going to be remarkable. And that, so that gets you like 80% of the way there, just with a basic, quick, mouth-blowing, common-sense approach. Okay, now from there... Okay, we can, we can get more dialed in by actually playing the pipes, okay? And what, what I'll do when I'm playing the pipes is I'll start with one drone read open, and I'll start with just one drone read going, one drone going with my chanter, and I'll play. And as I'm playing, I will purposefully begin to overblow, okay? Mm -hmm. And what I should find 
uh, this is method two I'm talking through. What I should find so is we're no longer quick and dirty. We're now we're we're, we're now blow. like we're now as scientific as you probably ever need to get. So as mm -hmm. with one drone going, I'm going to gradually begin to overblow. Okay, and what I should find is right about the point where my chanter starts to misbehave and get squeaky and squawky. I should find that that drone read also shuts off because mm -hmm. it's now overwhelmed with air, right? That, that would mean the drone read is operating as efficiently as it reasonably can if it shuts mm -hmm. off just above the pressure that it's currently operating, right? It's just basic logic. Yeah. So now I have that one drone read calibrated perfectly the way that I want. Okay, the next step is I'm gonna take my chanter out of the pipes. And you can either cork up the chanter stock or uh, I, I use my thumb right up in the stock to cut off all the air. And now I'm just going to play my drones. I'm going to open up a second drone. I'm going to gradually increase the pressure uh, on those two drones. And what I should find is that both the, the control drone, the one that I tested against the chanter, I should find that drone and the new drone both shut off at exactly the same pressure. And if they don't... Oh, yeah. If they don't, I adjust the second drone so that it perfectly matches the other one in terms of air efficiency. So the first drone and the second drone now, when I gradually increase the pressure, they both shut off at exactly the same point in time, right? Then I'll add the third drone in, get that one calibrated in, right? And, you know, common sense rule, I'm going to test that a few times. But now I have three drones calibrated, not just to the strength of the chanter, but also to the exact same calibration with each other, which with all the other drones. Okay. And that mm. you will find, uh, won't just make your bagpipe feel really easy and comfortable to play, but the drones themselves as a unit will be, um, significantly more tunable. Another anecdote, another anecdote for you. I was hanging out with a very famous piper who, uh, right before the medals, like probably in 2005 or something, we were hanging out together and the person was having a really hard time getting their pipes locked in. I was feeling a lot of frustration. Um, and then this was back before the word calibration was a word in my mind. But I remember suggesting like, have you tested each drone read to make sure each drone reads like taking basically the same amount of air? Sure enough. Um, sure enough, it wasn't. And, um, they, uh, I think they closed down the base drone read fairly significantly and then everything resolved itself really, really nicely. Let's just Did say Did they that go player, on to win gold that day? Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised because they're the type of player that just basically won everything. Well, and the if time. they did, then really that medal belongs to you. Um, that's not what I'm saying at all. Stop trying to get me in trouble. No, I'm not trying to say that at all. What I am trying to say, however, is um, you know, getting the drone reads right is not that's not just a beginner thing. It's something that an right, advanced yeah. player. It's something that an advanced player is naturally keeping an eye on all the time because it's a key ingredient, not just to your bagpipe yeah. being comfortable, but it's a key ingredient to being able to tune your bagpipe as well. Okay, that um, is that's an yeah. effect that I also observed that I wasn't expecting, but have, have been so pleasantly surprised. Like I've always had a hard time tuning myself, and I still do. I really like. It's not like I became a pro, but. I was amazed, especially between the tenors. Once, once I, once Swan showed me how to calibrate stuff, like I could, I could tell so much more easily. I think before I would hear something off about some, a vibration was off. So like maybe tonally they matched, but there was some vibration that was off still. And so then I'd keep messing with them. But uh, yeah, for sure. It made it well, so much easier to tune myself. So, so another thing to think about if we wanted to go further down the rabbit hole, okay, the reason, one of the I reasons, cali the, one of the reasons calibration is so important. Okay. Super important. Uh, is that the, the, the more closed the aperture of the read is, and this is a generalized statement. Okay. So this is going to be true. 97% of the time, there's going to be 3% of the time where you close the aperture and things start to get weird. So, uh, you can worry about that 3% some other time, but 97%, of the time, uh, as a rule, when you, when you, the, the more reduced the aperture is, okay, so the more closed down the read is, the less susceptible it is to pitch changes as a result of pressure change inside the instrument. Mm. So it's, uh, so it's less, so the degree to which the pitch changes 
uh, the, the degree becomes less with, with pressure changes. And what, so what does that mean? What that means is, uh, and what that means is, unless you're a perfectly steady blower, do you know any perfectly steady blowers? I don't. But if you're not perfectly steady, it'll be impossible to truly get your pipes in tune without them being calibrated. What, that's what that means, mm-hmm. right? So, uh, and you would need to be perfectly steady to hold that together. So the real reason tuning gets easier with good calibration, uh, well, it's, the reason is twofold, but number one is the, the, the drones themselves are not actually moving all over the place pitch-wise as a result of bad blowing like they were before. Now they're just moving right. a little bit. Now they're just moving a little bit because the aperture is closed, right? And there's less like huge room for these big pitch swings, right? That, that's reason number one. And then reason number two is sort of conceptually, all three of the drones are exactly the same now. So now they're changing very little with pressure changes and they're all behaving quote unquote the same. And that's mm-hmm. what makes tuning considerably more possible. But if you don't know what calibration is and haven't managed to get it, uh, you're not going to manage to get any sort of drone tuning either, at least not without a significant amount of luck. But by the way, that's another, you know, and then just continuing, just to continuing to twist the dagger in. That's another reason why a, a, a digital tuner can't tune your pipes for you. It's because the digital tuner can't tell you, hey, by the, we, by the way, the reason the needle keeps going like this is because of your calibration. A digital tuner can't tell you that. It can give you maybe a clue, can give you a reference point. But uh, at the end of the day, you're going to have to calibrate, and then you know, you're going to have to learn the ins and outs of tuning as well. Maybe a topic for another podcast. That's a lot about calibration mm-hmm. there. People are going well, to people are going to be wishing they skipped this one. Given dude, the length if, of if, that if anybody hasn't tried it and tries it, I think they'll be immediately convinced because yeah. it, it it kind of it kind of. Uh, uh, gave me a new lease on life in some ways. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about the let's talk about the risks, okay? Risks of calibration. Yeah, well, how can it be done poorly? Tell me about yeah, that. Yeah, it can definitely be done poorly. The most common way I see it being done poorly is people can't leave well enough alone. Right? Mm. So, uh so you get addicted to calibration and then you're just calibrating all over the place uh where what you needed to do is quit while you were ahead. Right. So mm-hmm. that, that first method of calibration that I taught you, I really recommend just going with it, get, get something simple, get everything in the ballpark and then just enjoy playing for a while and, you know, wait until there's a real need before you up your game and start getting more and more cerebral about calibration. Okay. Because if all you ever do is fart around with your drone reads, first of all, that's not going to be good for your drone reads. You know what I mean? Like you're, they're going to end up, the bridles will end up wearing out and then, you know, uh, the reed will kind of be garbage and you might not even really recognize it until it's too late, blah, blah, blah. So we don't want to do it all day, every day, right? And then the other thing is it's going to distract you from practicing the things that really matter, like steady blowing, mm-hmm. you know, like steady blowing at the end of the day, right? Decreases your reliance on perfect calibration. So we should be focusing on that. That would just, that's just one example. Uh, but if you're playing with your reads all the time, constantly, and just forever tweaking them, like I kind of fall into that trap if I'm not careful, mm. especially in the old, especially in the solo playing days, cane drone reads are a lot easier in some respects from a calibration standpoint. Um, but, uh, but I, you know, in the, in the high level solo competition mindset, you know, I end up just tinkering with my drones. And at the end of the day, you just, at some point you got to get them good and then just play. Mm-hmm. you know and um and then the other thing would be um the other the other potential pitfall or the uh, an advanced thing that you have to remember is sometimes it takes a little while so let's say you do some calibration on your drone reads what you might find is the next day you strike up your pipes and they're not and they're not right mm-hmm. maybe they're shutting off early or they're still not quite right and I think that probably has to do with the fact that the rubber band probably ha- takes time to settle after it's been stretched and things get a little bit weird and, you know, maybe the environment is slightly different and so on and so forth. So it actually takes a couple of days and a couple of playing sessions for changes to really kind of settle in. So, so there's like an approximate component, 
especially when you're thinking about things at a slightly higher level. So there's an element of patience that you really need to, to work in there. So, uh, the, you know, potential risks. The other potential oh, like, risk like, is, like, the, the last potential risk is uh, annoying your pipe major or teacher. Like your, yeah. your teacher will, will be really annoyed that you showed up and your drones aren't good at your lesson because you've been attempting to quote unquote calibrate them. Um, I reject that one. You know, we need everyone to learn how to do this, even if it means occasionally showing up to band practice with drone reads that aren't good, right? That's an opportunity for us to teach those people and to give them some tips and to help them. But uh, I don't want to play in a band unless everyone in the band understands the basics of, you know, getting their drone reads calibrated and locked in. Be you know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. so that last one, if your teacher is just annoyed because you keep tinkering with things, you know, uh, within reason, your teacher should get just over tell him it. Andrew Douglas said it's okay. That, that that always works, doesn't it? That Everybody always works. That. <laughs> Every private instructor loves to hear that. I'm sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there's like so you have a, you have to have sovereignty over your own instrument. Okay. Yeah, for sure. And playing in a band doesn't change that. It, in my opinion, it amplifies it. Like playing in a band yeah. means, like if you and I were going to enter into a band together, there's an unwritten bro code there. Which is someday, which, someday, which is, Andrew, we'll start a new band. But only if you understand the, the bro Piper code, which is if we're in a band together, <laughs> Jim is going to do what he needs to do to get his bagpipe to sound as good as he can get it. And I'm going to do that too. And I'm going to do that. We're all mm -hmm. going to do that on a regular basis. That's what playing in a band means. Okay. It does right. not mean, it does not mean Jim and I get to come to band practice for, so the pipe major can set up our pipes the way the pipe major wants, blah, blah, blah. That's not what it is. Right. And so, uh, and so, yeah, we, we all have to get to that point somehow where we understand yeah. how to get our bagpipe efficient and, and sounding as good as it can. And the pipe major can help in that process. And pipe major is certainly going to be involved on the day, helping us get our, our tuning in perfect unison. But there's, there's that personal sovereignty that everybody needs. This is like if we had like a marriage counselor for a, for a pipe band. And they'd sit down and talk to every member of the pipe band about how individuation will actually make them better partners for each other. You know, yes. Yes. not that I know anything about that because my marriage is so perfect. I've never needed counseling. I just hear that that's advice that some yeah, I got might this get. friend. I got this friend. <laughs> right. <told> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, uh, if, oh, for sure. I, I, I mean, uh, it's, we've talked for way too long already. But, uh, but you're absolutely right. We should talk about that sometime on a little episode. Just like, what is a pipe band really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 